Welcome to Lift Your Legacy. My name is Jacob Rupp, father, husband, and rabbi. And each week we bring you an inspiring person or message to help you unlock your inner potential and create change that will impact the future. Thank you for listening and let's get to it. The power of stories. So it's very interesting because we feel like if we want to know something, we read nonfiction. We, uh, you know, we take our, our knowledge from the hard sciences. And as people who are not just intellectual, in fact, most of our thinking is subconscious, most of our thinking is based in our emotions, etc. cetera, um, it's very hard if you are not able to utilize these like massive parts of our personality in order to get the lessons deep inside. And sometimes if we're able to unlock how we feel emotionally about an issue or go back where that thing was put in our brains and why we think it's true and all that kind of stuff, it creates instantaneous change, which is not just a quick fix band-aid that goes on on you know an emotional wound or a, a life that is not exactly where we want to be. So that being said, I'm thrilled to have on Hannah Mason, who is a coach and an author of many amazing books, to discuss the roles of stories in our lives, how we are able to best integrate important ideas, and how we can really grow into the people we want to be. Thanks so much. I know you'll enjoy this. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this podcast has been brought to you by me, Jacob Rupp and Jacob Rupp's Consulting, uh, technically Lift Your Legacy. Now, I have to be honest, I help clients often get out of their own way. And something that has really held me up was exactly the same thing, that I was in my own way. For months, people have been saying, you know, talk about your coaching, talk about how you help people, share it, etc. And I had a really hard time putting it out there. Why? Because it's not that I don't think I do a great job. I've seen amazing results from my clients, you know, 10x, uh, more than that, businesses, fixed relationships, um, helped people lose a lot of weight, people go on the path of, of making goals and fulfilling their goals, all of these things. I know I do it. And I've been in the coaching space long enough to know that there's a lot of people that don't really deliver. And the ones that do really deliver are, are worth literally their, their weight in gold because so often we're held back by stuff. And it's just like, if only I could get over that, if only I could work through that. And I help people do that. But for me, my big holdup was sharing that I do this in a big way, in a public way, especially on the podcast, because it's awkward. I don't want people to think, oh, I'm just making the podcast to, to sell you stuff or to talk about stuff. So that, that's not what I'm doing. Um, my point is like this. My coaching business is expanding. I'm taking on a few more clients. If you are someone that is struggling in the area of self-esteem, goal setting, health, relationships, or your, or your business, really, um, reach out. I don't know if we're a good fit to work with each other. What I can guarantee you is that we'll get on the phone for half an hour. Uh, I'll hear the kind of challenges you're having. You'll get a good feel if you don't know me yet of the kind of work I do, kind of program I would recommend for you. And if it's a great fit, we'll move forward. And if not, not. But I wanted to appreciate very much from the bottom of my heart, the fact that you guys all listen. I appreciate the amazing guests that I have. And I'm really thrilled to have broken through in my own life to the point where I could actually devote a segment to really make a somewhat long-winded, but I think very important advertisement. So if you want to reach out to me, the email is rabbi, R-A-B-B-I, Rupp at gmail.com. And the website is liftyourlegacy.live and at lift, your legacy, lift underscore your underscore legacy on Instagram. I think it's pretty simple. You, you know where to find me because you found the podcast. Thank you so much. Hunter Mason, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm thrilled to have someone who's an expert in storytelling. You are an author. You are a coach. Can be a little bit up to date. How did you start being you? Like what was your, what was your path to getting to being this person that, that learns and teaches and is so involved in helping people live more meaningful lives? Um, so... So I had a pretty traumatic experience when I was a kid that kind of like set into motion my desire to create healing. Um, I'm originally from Colombia, South America. And when I was five years old, these men came into our house with guns and it was pretty scary and ugly and threatened to kidnap my sisters and me. And 
thank God, like within 48 hours, we fled the country and moved to Miami, which is kind of a suburb of Colombia, you know, like LA is a suburb of Mexico. And um, so Spanglish is my native tongue. And I always kind of felt like an outsider, like not Colombian, not American, and always really trying to navigate different cultures and different languages. And I think that's always made me someone who's like, really into observing people and trying to understand people and how they work and also trying to understand like my own pain and whatever I was going through. Um, and what I studied in university was, uh, was theater, actually, I also studied engineering, but we'll put that to the side for now. And I became a theatrical director. And that's when I really got passionate about leading groups of people and trying to understand really how people work. And for some reason, I just have a knack for knowing what works and what doesn't work. And what I, what I did in theater is exactly what I do now with my clients, which is I come up with exercises to help, care, to help actors live and understand what's happening with characters. Um, and so sometimes you need to like physically experience what's going on with a character or physically play something out and it'll just like help something really come in. And uh, over the past couple of years, as I've been learning neuro-linguistic programming, it's like, oh my gosh, that's what NLP is all about. It's about using the physical space of the world to help people um, shift in their consciousness. So, and, how, so I'm so yeah. sorry to interrupt. So, so help me out a little bit for, for those who are not familiar with NLP and for this kind of unique simulation. Um, tell me, like, do you have an example of a specific problem that a client has been working on and, and a, uh, you know, kind of an exercise that you built for them? Um, yeah, so this wouldn't be exactly NLP. Um, this is much more based on the tools of inquiry, which are uh, the tools that I put in my book, Hold That Thought. So there's this, this one um, uh, female client who I had who was really trying to attract like really great guys into her life. And she kept feeling like she was just attracting guys who were just, in her words, losers. And um, so so I was seeing that she had this like dichotomy of on the one hand wanting a guy who was really great, but feeling like that was beyond her, but also being really unhappy with what she had. So she had kind of, it was like a lose lose situation because she felt like it was untenable. So immediately I said, okay, I want you to do the following. I want you to create a chart. And on one side of the chart, I want you to write, I deserve losers because, and on the other side of the chart, I don't deserve winners because right. And she knew exactly what those words meant because they, you know, they came from her and they were loaded with all of her vision of what she really wanted in life. Because we'd done a whole visualization exercise, but it was hard for her to believe that it could really happen. So that's what she did for homework. And she collected like so many beliefs she had about why she deserved the bad guys and why she didn't deserve the good guys. And those beliefs became what we worked on for the next few weeks. And one of those beliefs was that she was scared of attracting a good guy because she was scared that she would take advantage of him. And so I said, well, where do you, where do you get this idea? And she happens to be one of those people who's like the most caring, giving, kind, like the last person you think would be taking advantage of people, right? Um, and I said, where did this belief come from? She's like, I don't know. I've just always believed that I take advantage of people. So, um, so this is kind of related to NLP. I brought her back in time. And one of the things that happens in our working on ourselves is that sometimes like we literally trap uh, traumas or experiences or beliefs in a certain space, physical space. Like we use our, our minds are actually very physical. So we'll use the physical space to plant ideas and we use our bodies to plant ideas. And we also plant ideas in time. So boom, she all of a sudden went back to when she was seven years old. We didn't do regression or anything. I just asked her when was the first time she believed that thought and she, just a memory came right up. She was seven years old and sitting um, at the table with her dad and her parents were divorced and she was at her dad's kitchen table and he was cooking her dinner and she was doing her homework and she felt like she was taking advantage of him. And I said to her, why are you taking advantage of him? And what I had her do is she facilitated her younger self and I gave her the tools to do that so that she could really be a part of her younger self's healing. And she said, I don't know. It just, he's doing so much and I'm not helping him. And so I asked her older self to kind of come in and bring her life wisdom to the picture. And her older self was like, wait a second. Like, it's totally normal. My dad was so happy to cook me dinner. He wasn't asking for my help. I wasn't refusing it. He wanted me to sit down and do my homework. 
And it all of a sudden just like shifted everything. And she stopped seeing herself as someone who takes advantage of people. And it's just boom, just like that to be able to go to a, a different place in time and just create a shift really quickly. So what, what's so amazing about that idea is how co- counterintuitive it is to how most of us think. And this is also something that I experience a lot with myself and with clients that I work with is we will find an issue. You say you like identify that specific belief system and right away it's like, okay, what do I do about it? And it's not about, it's like trying to figure out like a small strategy to like undo and uproot this thing that's been fundamentally, you know, cha- you know, like just in your mind for, for all of these years. And, and it's just like, that's not, that's not practical. And I think that so many people are trying to figure out a quick fix and are not appreciating, like exactly like you said, how experiences and traumas, even if it's not like a, over, you know, you have, you, you, you have a legitimate trauma, you know what I'm saying? It's like where someone came into your house, but like, even that had this profound effect on her life that she wasn't even aware of. And I think that that's right. a fundamental idea that we are, we're not operating at zero, that when we walk into the world and we go through things in our life, we're actually operating a product of all of those different components of our lives up until this point. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about this idea of learning through stories, because what's really captivating about this specific idea, you know, is that the, the, the use of a muscle or the use of, you know, with, with the endless streaming opportunities of, you know, Prime and Netflix, there are so many fictitious stories that go out there. And on one hand, you think, well, it's kind of a waste of a time. On the other hand, there are a lot of deep things that are more effectively captured in stories than in nonfiction. So tell me a little bit about that process for you and what, how you kind of mask ideas in stories? So, so stories are innately, I believe they're like really awesome packages with like an awesome bow and like great wrapping paper for truth, right? So you're saying these stories are fictitious. I actually see them as totally the opposite. I see them as immensely true. And that sometimes stories that are factual are less true than stories that are not factual. This is something that's really, really... So that's something that's really important in our rabbinic tradition. So for example, um, you know, there's a story in the Bible of, of um, Jacob coming to a well and meeting Rachel and the rabbis come in and give this commentary about Rachel being three years old, right? And you could take it as literal, in which case the, Rebecca. that becomes a- Rebecca was three, I think. Whatever. I was think, it Rebecca? It was Rebecca is three. No, like he kissed it. her and she was three. I don't know. Maybe it was Rebecca. I thought it was maybe, Rachel. Maybe whatever, I'm, right. I'm sorry. I, I can't could remember have this. It, wrong. it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, right? He definitely so, kissed her at the well. That's for sure. Yes. So, so this, it, it kind of misses, right? So you could just take it as a fact, in which case it's just not particularly interesting. Or you could take it as a truth, which might not be factual, but might be communicating something entirely different about what does it mean to be three and what kind of purity and innocence does a three-year-old have and what type of openness and curiosity and willingness to be vulnerable and adventurous does a three-year-old have? And maybe that's what's getting communicated in that, in that story. Um, So what stories allow us to do, which factual um, representations don't is stories allow us to live through the lives of the characters. So when I tell you a story, if I were to say, um, I don't know, I'm making something up. Oh, no, this is true. There we go. So when I was 11 years old, I woke up one morning and found little tiny drops of blood on the kitchen floor. And, and, And then I looked at my dog and he was like at the end of that trail. And it was so painful. And I knew that something was really wrong right? And as I'm telling you this, my guess is you're emotionally already feeling like a little bit of shock, a little bit of sadness, because you're able to feel what I'm feeling. And so we want people to be able to experience that around the ideas that we're sharing. So right now we're working on a book on financial independence. And the main character um, is exploring different avenues of how to live life. One avenue is in the short term while she's in her 20s and 30s, living frugally, making solid cash flowing investments so that she can be financially independent for the rest of her life and use her time however she wants. The alternative is that she could um, live the way most people live, which is spending a lot, taking on a lot of debt, 
and um, being a part of things and not feeling left out, right? When her friends go out to lunch, she joins them. When people are getting the nice car, she wants to get the nice car, right? And, and we allow the, the, the reader to struggle between these two perspectives through the characters. So rather than us telling people, you have to do the financial independence thing, the, you know, the way we think is like the wisest move, we're actually allowing the reader to not argue with us. They get to argue with both of these sides and like live through both of them and get to feel what it's like to inhabit one space and to inhabit it in another space in the short term and also in the long term with the consequences that they produce. Now, what's so amazing about that concept that you're suggesting is that there is an emotional component of learning that is even more profound than an intellectual component of learning. Because, you know, and, and I think that that's also something that is really lost in, in most of our, gener- you know, our, in our generation, because we're so able to explain why everything happens because of either, you know, scientific technology or Google or whatever it might be, that we lose out a lot on the emotional learning, the emotional experience of, of feeling something. And as a result, of that, we don't actually get the lesson. So we might know why things happen, but it doesn't make us change or, or really bring that inside of us. Right. That's what like amazing educators inspire us. You know, they light us up. They make us want to aspire to something greater. My husband and I are big fans of Tony Robbins and we go to his events. He will get the entire crowd dancing, jumping up and down for like 15, 20 minutes at a time. And it might be two o'clock in the morning and you're fried. You've been in that room for like 14 hours and you don't know how you could have any more energy. And he gets you to do that. And then he says, okay, now write down your goals or now we're going to teach you a core tool or a core lesson. Now I want you to figure out a distinction that's going to help you move your life forward. And it's very clear that when you're in a high energetic, engaging your emotions, engaging your mind, your ability to learn is just that much greater. So for sure. Like, yeah, and, and, it, and it's crazy because most most people feel like that you know they are who they are, their thoughts are their thoughts, and you know their circumstance is their circumstance, and they don't necessarily see how you know maybe a maybe a setback at work or not enough sleep or you know some unhealthy habit is going to actually make them see a situation far more I guess you could say pessimistically than if they were. Had, like you said, had jumped around, had just even changed their posture, their position in order to think about it from a position where you're naturally fueling your body and your mind with, with positivity. Well, and, and the other piece, I mean, like when we're thinking about, for example, this financial independence book, this stuff, a lot of this stuff is boring for people. So my husband is really good at creating story structure and my job is to make it come to life. This is where my theater background really like helps, right? So I'm like, literally, you should see me at my desk. I'm like trying to figure out, okay, how does that person feel? How do they move? What does that taste like? You know, and I'm like literally moving my hands and my face and stuff. And part of it is I'm like, okay, how do we make this as not boring as possible? So I just wrote today about a guy who runs a, um, a venture capital fund. And he literally takes olives from the bar at a party and he's like using the olives to like tell a story about the olives in order to talk about how venture capital works. Because I'm like, I want it to be as playful as possible. And the numbers are there, but we're going to put the numbers on napkins or in the main character's notebook handwritten so that it's playful. Because for most people, it's just boring and we don't want to do what's boring. For a lot of people, they want to work on their personal growth. So the size of your dreams are personal growth book. Like people want to work on their personal growth. They want to become better people. But you pick up those nonfiction books and they're just boring. They're not so fun, right? But, but the people who've created, so a lot of the tools that we talk about in that book come from, were inspired from Napoleon Hill. And one of them at its core is the mastermind group. And we've gotten so many messages from people who are like, I created a mastermind group because of this book. It's changed my life. And it's like, why did they create a mastermind group? Because they got to feel what it was like to be in one. They got to feel every single character, not just the main character, but all of them be in a mastermind group and change because of it. They got to be in it. So it feels real to them and it's believable. And it's not just an intellectual concept. It's not boring. It's so fun. Do you find, let's say, you know, and, and perhaps this is qualifying a little bit, but do you find if a person f- doesn't get uh, excited by nonfiction, they feel bad? You know, they say, like, if I was just maybe smarter, if I was, you know, and I think that's a very fundamental 
point that you're making, which is that a person might actually have to learn to trust their emotions when it comes to the quality and quantity of what kind of information they're taking in. And as a result, kind of orient themselves. Again, this is a concept in, in, the, in the Torah where you're supposed to learn stuff that appeals to you. But most of us think, I have to learn this thing. I have to have this perspective. And if I don't, there's something fundamentally wrong with me. Yeah. So my, my husband, he was, um, he was learning yeshiva and he was learning Gemara like, because that's what everybody's supposed to do. They're supposed to learn from the Talmud and like, you know, be all into the illegal stuff. And he's an incredibly sharp guy and he's perfectly capable of learning this stuff, but it just didn't interest him that much. He's like, I just want the stories. So he finally let, you know, he got old enough that he didn't let his ego get in the way of actually following what interested him. And he did this deep dive into learning the stories of uh, Tanakh, of the Jewish Bible. And got so passionate about those stories and knows those stories backwards and forwards so much so that he went even deeper and he's like, look, there's all these prophets. Like what, what is prophecy and how does that work? And so then he took a deep dive into prophecy and he just like followed his passion and ended up writing a series of books. So the, and this is what got all of us writing in our household was my husband starting this thing. Um, the first one of which is called the lamp of darkness. And it's a, uh, it's basically like a Harry Potter in biblical Judaism and now sorry, biblical Israel. And it's like, wow, we have this like incredibly rich prophetic tradition. That's so magical. Like people travel all the way to India to explore traditions like this. And they don't know that we have it in our own tradition, but let's make it fun. Let's make it like Harry Potter. Right. And that's what he did. So it's that same thing of like, okay, stories are fun. Let's do it. So what do you see as the crossover? I think that there's a certain level of, distrust or fear when it comes to kind of the modern day, you know, NLP success training. Again, it's like modern, you know, Napoleon Hill was a long, was a long time ago, but he, relatively, you know, relatively recent. How do you help your clients who are, let's say, Jews who might, who need your help? You know, they, they didn't find the development in, within the, the literature or the learning or the lifestyle that they had, but they're like, you know, kind of like scared to venture outside of the quote unquote norm. So how do you make that bridge to show that the, the methodology you use is in line with Jewish tradition and, and maybe even made by God and maybe even what we're supposed to be doing? Um, so I haven't, with NLP, I haven't experienced that kind of like um, friction, but I have with the process of inquiry. Um, the main tools of inquiry I learned from uh, Byron Katie, who's not even remotely Jewish, right? And then Barry Neil Kaufman, who's, you know, Jewish by birth, but doesn't live in even remotely Jewish life. Can you sketch inquiry in a very broad sense for those that aren't familiar? So inquiry is a really simple concept. It's basically asking questions, questioning the veracity of your thinking, questioning how your thinking and your beliefs affect your physiology, your emotions, and your behavior, and then considering different options of how to think in a different way. Um, and the process of facilitating inquiry is really just about asking questions and not giving advice, not sharing opinions. I just hold a space. And um, part of it is also my deep, deep belief when I'm engaging with someone that their thoughts are not them. So we might be humiliated or ashamed by some of the thoughts that we have, but to me, they're just thoughts. They're not the person. Um, so that's the process of inquiry. And people are like, well, it didn't come from a Jewish source and this and that. First of all, it's, it's very similar to what's all over the Hasidic tradition. So that's really not so difficult, but at its core, what, what inquiry allows someone to do is get significantly more accepting and in touch of reality. It helps them be kinder and more compassionate. And it helps them turn back to face themselves and take responsibility for their lives. And that's just, that's what Torah is all about. So to me, it's really all about helping people get back to a place of emunah, of faith, faith in the world, right? Because usually when we believe something that's not true, we're arguing with reality. We're arguing with, with God. It's like a war. And to argue with God is not, is not being in a place of faith. And when we're in a place of faith, we're in a place of emunah, we just trust that everything is exactly the way that it's supposed to be. We don't say that things shouldn't be the way they are. And so when I taught that in workshops, I'll always get someone who says, well, what about a terrorist? You know, what about the stabbings that were in Jerusalem? You can't say that that should have been the way it was. 
And my real honest belief is, yes, it should have, because that's how it was, right? Everything should be exactly as it is. Not more, not less, not different, because I'm not God. I didn't create the world. I didn't create the past. I don't create the future. I can just accept things as they are in the present. Right. I, it's so funny, the timing of this, because I literally, I was trying to explain Imuna to, to a client of mine, and, and I literally just recommended that book. And it's so fascinating, because we have such a, we have such a, you know, a, you know I, I made this bad decision, or I chose X over Y, or maybe I should, and it's just like, well, no, you shouldn't have, because that's what you chose, or you got here, and it's not like you made a bunch of mistakes. It's just like, this is what happened. So let's, let's, let's figure it out. So that's, it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental and very exciting idea that you have. I wanted to ask sort of more in a, a, a I guess you could say on a broad scale, what do you feel like over your career or, or currently are like the biggest challenges that the clients that you help are facing? And what could you tell them about overcoming it? Ah, uh, so... So it could just be, this is like the, the, the main theme that's like taking over my life at the moment. And so those are the people that I'm attracting. That's what my, uh, my mentor always says, we attract whatever it is we need to work on. Um, but I think, that, I think that there's something about having an orderly mind. Hmm. So Rabbi R.A. Kaplan talks about, uh, in Jewish meditation, he talks about the Kabbalistic concept of mochin de katnut and mochin de gadlut. So small consciousness and big consciousness. But he doesn't use the word small and big. He says child and adult, um, which are actually probably more accurate translations of those terms. And he says a child's mind is totally disorganized and chaotic. And children, when they're hungry, they want to eat now. When they're thirsty, they want to drink now. When they want to play, they want to play now, right? It's like, and, and they'll jump from one activity to the other. But as adults, if we really want to live lives of meaning and purpose and success, we have to be able to say, I'm going to eat later. Right now, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to work on my book for three hours straight. And I'm not going to go check Facebook and I'm not going to do, go do this. I'm talking about myself because that was me this morning, right? Like I'm working on my book, but then I'm like, oh, I got a Facebook message, right? And that, that is just, that's a chaotic way of living, right? Where you're just jumping from one thing to the other and you don't have order. Um, and that's something for me that meditation has really been bringing. Can, in. I, can I interrupt you? I'm so sorry yeah. to do. I'm so sorry. As of my chaotic mind, you know, it's so interesting because what, what is so dangerous is when something looks orderly, but is actually chaotic. And what I'm thinking of as you, as you, as you mentioned that is the nature of the social media, the way that it continually, it's like, you know, like Instagram is one platform, but it's completely chaotic on the inside. There's always going to be that thing, that thing, that thing, and you, you'll, you can really never stop. And so it's very yes. interesting because, you know, it used to be, I'm guessing that you would know when you were distracted, but it's very easy nowadays to not be distracted because you're doing something via email, doing something via social media. And that's why it's so easy, I guess, to trick us into giving so much of its attention because it allows us to both be focused on Instagram and be chaotic on the inside. Right, because it's, it's, it's basically an addiction to busyness. Yes. We're, we're busy, but we're not something. productive. Yes, 100%. So how I do you fix that? that's where the line is. Um, how do you fix that? So something that I've been working on is, so first of all, the first thing I do in the morning, I don't turn on my phone. That's like rule number one. It's like I need to check into me. So I spend half an hour and, and I sit and meditate. And this is something I started doing a couple months ago and has been life altering for me to just be like, okay, I'm going to just sit. And my mind strays a bunch. And I learned from one of my teachers to just laugh at it, to not beat myself up over it, to just laugh and just say, ah, this is the mind. Okay. Coming back. And sometimes I even crack myself up. Like it's really funny. <laughs> um, and, and then what I like to do is sit with a hot cup of tea and write down my plan for the day. Like, what is it that, I'm, that I want to accomplish that day and how am I gonna organize my time accordingly? And being self-employed and spending most of my time at home, either working with clients or writing, really most of my time is spent writing and homemaking. Um, it's, 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 it's a struggle to make sure that I'm really organizing my time effectively. And when I have those blocks, making time for things that are nourishing, for play, for exercise, for reading, um, and 
one thing that my teacher, Danny Cohen, uh, taught <clears throat> at a meditation retreat I was at a couple months ago. He said, whenever you find yourself reaching for your phone, before you do that, and to me, this is part of having an orderly mind, is having enough self-control to even do what, what I'm about to say. Right before you reach for your phone, ask yourself the question, what do I need right now? What's the most nourishing thing I can do to feed that need? And usually what I need is a break. I need connection. I need um, play. So if I need connection, is Instagram the most connecting thing I can do? It's really going to just drop right off, right? I can just go to my husband and say, hey, I'd really love a hug right now. Um, if I need play, so that, then I can just like do a, a word jumble or actually play a game, right? Or I can just go sit and do some yoga if I need a break and I need to stretch and just clear my mind. So it's, to me, part... Part of what helps us have an orderly mind is doing these habits, but you kind of need to have the strength of will to put these habits into place. Like you have to get some fire in your belly and say, I'm going to take control over this part of my life. And that's where the orderly mind comes into play. And I don't mean orderly mind is an OCD, right? Because to me, OCD is still chaos, right? It's like, I'm doing something as a reactive tool, but I'm not really taking control and deciding what's going to be the most nourishing or most productive thing I can do with my time right now. That's tremendous. It's, it's really such a brilliant question because it, it, it gives people so much um, authority over their own life. And if they ask, what do I need versus, you know, just kind of like medicate themselves and be distracted with, with I mean, maybe I'm just speaking for myself with, with, uh, with social media, it, it really it profoundly helps. Then you're like, oh, I don't, I don't need to be doing this. Or like, you know, you're laying in bed and you're drooling on yourself because you're so tired and you're just like scrolling through the feed. And you're like, maybe I should get up and go to bed. You know what I mean? So it's, 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 uh, it's fascinating. Okay, Hannah, thank you so much for your time. Tell people how they can find you, listen to you, your exciting project, et cetera. Awesome, cool. So um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, I have a website, hannamason.com. That's C-H-A-N-A-M-A-S-O-N.com. You can also find me on Facebook. I'm the one who looks like a Jewish lady. Um, there's like very few Hannah Masons and the other one's like African American. Um, and on Facebook, I post a daily video where I'm teaching a lot of these tools and sharing a lot of my knowledge. Um, and also you can find my books on Amazon at my author page. Again, my name is C-H-A-N-A-M-A-S-O-N. And um, you can see my books there and they're available as free downloads on Amazon Kindle or you can buy yourself a hard copy so you can really dig in. Amazing. Hannah, thank you so much. The pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Pleasure. There you have it, folks. Another inspiring episode. If you enjoyed this, I ask you to please share this with your friends and to like us over on Rabbi Rupp through Facebook or on YouTube. And the more that we're able to get these important messages out, the more that we can really make an impact in the world. So I encourage you, please, to stay tuned. Uh, we have a ton of amazing speakers coming up and also to tell your friends about it. Thank you very much.